Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Marco. Sean. I have nothing. <laughs> I, don't, I don't believe you. You always have something. Get it, it's like, get it it's good. like, you know, I'm, I'm, afraid to, I'm afraid to make a joke at the expense of uh, a company's no, name. No, we don't. We don't, <laughs> don't have to. Make, anybody. I'm like, no, I have a joke. No, I'm not going to do it. We don't have to be funny all the time. I mean, uh, yeah. you're you're naturally funny, so you know I just follow. Look, but looking, and I'm told but the that tension, I... Sean, is it's this. You know, if you, I love to play uh, ping pong, tennis table, <laughs> and it's kind of like I wait for you to serve. You have no idea where it's coming, That's if it's right. going to be a spin or. But now you tell me nothing. That that alone already <laughs> put me in the corner. So I don't know what to do anymore. That's right. But uh, no, it, it doesn't matter. What it really matters is that we are on the chats on the road to Black Hat 2023 Las Vegas. And with that, it comes everything else that happened around that. Uh, exactly. DevCon besides and uh, many, many other events, Squad Con and many, many more. Yep. And we tease, Absolutely. we tease some uh, event that happened there, some talk, so that people that actually are going to be in Vegas, they can go and take part and listen to people making this fantastic presentation. So exactly. just in case you forgot about it, I'm, I reminded you. <laughs> so I did forget why we did this. No, I think the, the there's so much content at Black Hat, and, and we kick off the series with Steve Wiley, the GM of, of the conference, and he gives us a nice overview. But then I go in and find sessions that I think are really cool and that our audience would like to hear about. And this is one of them. Uh, real world case of security technologies being employed and uh, doing so to help the business and, and not screw with uh, the user experience too much. And so the, the story is really cool to me. I'm on the ops guys, you know, Marco. So I'm... We're not going to get all the details today, but John Swanson's with us, and he's going to share a bit about his session, which is actually called, uh, I was tasked in, with enrolling millions of developers in 2FA, which is two-factor off, and here's what happened. So that's that's the story he's going to tell at Black Hat. We're going to get uh, a snippet of that from him today uh, and talk about that the, the, the 2FA challenge at broad strokes as well. But before we do that, John... Um, who are you? What what's your role in GitHub and uh, and the, the the driver behind uh, presenting this to the Black Hat? It's not an easy feat to get a, a presentation selected there. Yeah. So first, thanks for having me. Uh, this is really fun. Um, so yeah, my name is John Swanson. I'm the director of security strategy at GitHub. Um, GitHub, for I imagine most of your audience will know who GitHub is, but just in case. Um, you know, we're really about empowering developers and we've got about a hundred thousand or hundred, excuse me, a hundred million developers on the platform. Uh, and part of this work is really about better protecting them. Um, so, uh, what kind of drove me to, to give this talk is obviously we want to bring some awareness to the effort that we'll talk about in more detail. Um, but I think also this is a, a tricky area for folks in that it is very simple on the surface, but there's a, a careful balancing act. And I think you, you referenced it in your introduction. It's how do we, how do we, you know, balance the usability and the security outcomes that we want uh, to produce a great experience that better protects the entire software ecosystem. And, and doesn't knock you over in the process. That's right. Us, <laughs> us or our customers. That's really important. Yeah, exactly. So let's, um, let, let's talk about, Let's see where, where to start here because there's so many things we can get into. I think the the, the importance of two factor auth in, in GitHub. I think most people can probably recognize the the value of that. Um, and I don't know what what stats you're going to share uh, in in the session, but do you, generally speaking, do you feel people embrace a technology like that? 
generally speaking, and and what were you expecting as they as they uh, enabled that feature <laughs> once it was deployed? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. And you know, I, I had a slide that I eventually cut in my talk, and it it was you know. 2FA is increasingly ubiquitous. It's it's much more normalized than it used to be. So is this worthy of this kind of effort? But I think the answer to that question is, is yes. Um, you know, I think it's something like 80% of breaches, uh, according to the FIDO Alliance, they believe still stem from social engineering and, and account takeover or, or similar. Um, and so I think it's still a problem space that's significant. And, you know, when we look at the, the broader software security um, or the software supply chain and the security of it, um, you know, it's it, there's a lot of conversation about, you know, zero day exploits and compromising build pipelines and things like that. But at the end of the day, if an engineer or developer's account is compromised, it's game over. And we think this is a really impactful way to move the needle on this. Uh, and we think, you know, GitHub has a, a, a position uh, sort of, of of some responsibility in some senses. Uh, we have 100 million developers on the platform. A substantial amount of the open source software is built, at least in part, on GitHub. Uh, and we really think this is a good opportunity for us to raise the bar for everyone. Yeah, and I, I'm going to get in with the idea that we know we need this at not just developer, not just B2B or in specific industry. And it's so hard, right? I mean, <laughs> just go tell that to your mom or someone else to, to use a 2FA. Now, do I have to do that? So the experience that, that you get from these versus the experience that, you know, that compromise between easy to use, more secure, which I never understood why we have to choose between the two. But, you know, what what does this story tells you to to by thinking to a wider audience as well? Yeah, I mean, I think this is the, the crux of the challenge, and this is what makes it so so interesting, and, and it was sort of fascinating for me to, to be involved with. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, I was responsible for transitioning uh, GitHub internally from a good 2FA setup to an even stronger one uh, around WebAuthn and, um, you know, increasing our phishing resistance. And I got a really good look at sort of that um, experience, that balancing act of the usability and the security properties. And we had to figure out how to do it right so that our employees didn't have a bad experience with it. We were very successful with that at the end of the day, but I, I was able to carry a lot of those lessons into this work when we started looking at the broader platform. And you know, we looked at a lot of data as part of our, our, our research for the program. Um, and we invested quite heavily in user security historically. Um, we have a number of features in this space. So there's not a, it's not a case of like GitHub wasn't wasn't doing its due diligence or didn't have great features in this space, but we still looked at the data and still believed that we could create a better user experience. So we did a number of different things and I'm happy to go into some level of detail about those, but we really emphasized that for about a year before we ever touched any kind of enrollment uh, or enforcement, if you will. Um, so I think really critically, you have to look at the what the data can tell you about the friction your users are experiencing, find the pain points, and effectively target those with with deliberate investments and improvements in the user experience. So as, as very brief examples, uh, we looked at um, the rate of, of downloading or printing recovery codes because we found that folks weren't doing that very frequently. So we targeted some improvements to, to drive that up. Um, we also looked at you know, how, fa how folks um, interact with factors. Do they do they configure one factor? Do they configure two factors? And we, we tried to see how we could move the needle on that to make it more um, resilient, if you will, their setups. Um, and then obviously, I think we've got some things going on in the ecosystem, which will start to make this better too. Uh, we've got pass keys coming along now, and there's still some, some evolution that I think needs to happen there, and, but I see a lot of really good progress in the ecosystem. Um, but I think pass keys, which we actually re uh, released in public beta last month, um, will probably mean that, that 2FA becomes much more accessible and reliable and durable going forward. So talk to me a bit about setting up the program. Sounds like you've personally had a lot of time to think about it, do it in, in some instances in different scope. Um, how did, what, what was the driver, I guess, for initiating the program and, and who is, 
who is involved in kind of determining here's generally what we want to do, the scope of it, kind of so that, that upfront part of, of actually saying that this is what we plan to do and we think it might take this long. <laughs> Yeah, so this is probably a good opportunity to to tell a little bit of a story, and I kind of get into this in my talk, but I think it's it's good good background, and we can share it here as well. But um, for a number of years at GitHub, I was responsible for building and leading um, our incident response, threat detection, and threat intelligence capabilities. And during a lot of that time, um, we were involved in investigating compromises that occurred on the platform as well, not just at GitHub. So, though we don't have a, a formal like accountability. Uh, for you know a, a user account that is compromised through social engineering, GitHub strongly believes that we're an important part of the, the security of the broader ecosystem. And so we invested time and cycles in investigating and remediating and notifying those cases when we found them. Um, but you know, over time, I began to think about what can we do better here. And as I mentioned, like we were investing fairly heavily in user security. We've got things like uh, compromised password detection. Uh, we have user device verification. Uh, which helps with those types of cases. But, you know, when you see it somewhat frequently, it's something that you think a lot about and you think about, well, how, can we, how can we improve this? So a couple of years ago now, uh, our chief security officer pulled me aside one day and said, how would you feel about a change of scenery effectively? And he asked me if I, if I was willing to go and lead this sort of cross-functional effort among a good number of teams, which was really in many ways more of a product effort than not. And that's not really my background. I mean, I'm an incident responder by trade. Um, but he, he was looking for somebody who had that broader context um, to go and be involved. And so that's where things started. Um, basically, we, we then built a, a broad collaborative project team uh, focused around not only sort of the, the identity engineering folks who would be responsible for most of the technical and the platform changes to make it happen in practice, um, but also a broadcast of other characters. And I think this is really important. Um, we involve folks from internal communications, public relations, legal uh, support was extremely important and our customer success functions as well um, to really bring in as many perspectives as we could to during both the research and the planning phases and then also in the execution phases. And I'm happy to go into more detail about those if they're interesting, um, but I think that's a real key part of the project. It is, but I, what I'd like, to hear from you and you, you, you touch on it uh, in the description of your session, it, it's the word principles. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can share what they are, or at least kind of paint a picture there for how you rally this team. I've, I've led cross-functional teams before and it's, it can be challenging if you don't have like complete control over them to do what they want to do. You have competing priorities. Yours doesn't hardly ever make the list until somebody else says they must. So how, how do you how do you define the guiding principles that everybody can not just agree to, but be happy to commit to? I wondered about this, and, and especially when you are a security professional that's being asked to go sort of lead an effort that's primarily a product effort. You, you wonder how that's going to go. Um, I think as a starting point, I'm very grateful uh, for the folks that I work with and the, the culture that we have internally. Um, they've always been great when security raises its hand and says, hey, we need to take on some work or look at a hard problem. But I think there's a, a sort of a, an ethos or, or something endemic to our culture, you know, where we really believe that the security of the broader ecosystem is important. And that's outside of security itself. This, this runs across the business. Um, we are a consumer of open source software, just like anybody else. And this is a huge opportunity. All of us agree, everybody who's done the work, uh, to sort of raise the bar and help protect not only GitHub, but the entire community. Um, we really think it's it's part of our responsibility, our core responsibility uh, to help protect the broader community and, and developers and make, make software safer uh, all around. So that's a huge thing. And I think that made it very easy. No one had to ask me why. Um, I never had to explain why to anyone. It was clearly evident from the start why we were investing in this work. Now, in terms of the rest of our operating principles, um, for me, it's it's pretty simple, I think. And I'll, I'll talk more about this in, in my talk, but, you know, good collaborative practices, uh, very open, honest, transparent, uh, make sure folks have space to, to speak their, their mind, um, to represent their needs or interests or priorities effectively. Um, 
show openness and, and gratitude uh, for the work that's done very transparently and visibly. I think that helps create a, a safe and healthy environment. Now, about the work itself, um, I'm actually going to share a couple of the principles sort of directly during the talk. But what they really boil down to is is sort of balancing, um, as I mentioned earlier, the sort of security outcomes and the usability. Uh, I like to say that if security isn't usable, it isn't security at all. So I think that is kind of the um, the overriding ethos of the principles internally in terms of like the tactical program itself. Um, that was something that that we really kind of set down in stone and have adhered to as somewhat of a, a North Star during the program. So you, you mentioned culture, like maybe I, I didn't really mark it down, but at least three times in the last uh... You know, uh, me, a few minutes, and and I'm a big fan of that. I was reading your bio, and you have a, a master of uh, in um, actually a, a, a degree in political science, which I do. It's the art of compromise politics. So, let's talk about culture a little bit. I mean, either you you, you I know you're going to talk about that in in the presentation. I don't want you to give that up, but in general, your approach. Uh, historically speaking, as society, why is so hard <laughs> this security? Why it's so hard to implement all of this? And what is the role of culture? Because for me, it's, culture means way more than the technology. I mean, the role of cultural changes. It's it's more efficient and effective than than the technology itself. If you cannot put it in place. So what's your thought on that? Yeah, you know, I think whether this is circumstance or, or it's more common than, than most of us would be led to believe, I think a lot of the problems that I've worked on are really human problems and not technical problems at their core. Um, and obviously as a sort of a, a career incident responder before, before this interesting turn in my career, um, you really are focused on human problems. They have a technical underpinning, but that is an exercise in trying to drive the human outcomes that you need. And there's broad perspectives on it. It's it's not just about, you know, what data was involved and where did it go and things like that. It's about, okay, what are the reputational implications of this? What um, what other teams need to be made aware so, so that they can be read in and prepared and not be surprised. Those are all human functions and it's a, it's a human game in, the, in that sense. Um, so this is something that just personally and, and professionally I've always sort of valued and, and sort of um, oriented toward. But I think, you know, oftentimes, I'm not shy about saying this, I think risk professionals uh, have a little bit of a tendency and, and guilty at times, I have to remind myself of this, um, to take that risk first aggressive approach to solving problems or to securing a business. And like I said a couple of minutes ago, it really does boil down to if security isn't usable, it isn't security at all. Because when you lose the, the buy-in and the trust of your customers or your employees through the, the means you, you are introducing to protect the business, they end up going around the, the controls that you've built. Um, so a thing that I've, I've mentioned in the past is uh, culture as a control. I believe very strongly that you have to build and curate and maintain a healthy culture around security that's a two-way trust transaction. Um, and I think that's true whether you're talking about um, your internal employees or your customer base. Well, I could spend uh, hours with you, John. Uh, sadly, that's how my brain works. Um, pick, picking apart everything, not picking apart, but just kind of digging into everything you've done because I'm, I'm fascinated by big programs and projects like this. Um, but I'm going to stick with, as we, as we wrap here, stick with kind of the culture piece. And you mentioned early on looking at some data early to determine perhaps a, a good strategy to move forward with. And again, not, not giving anything away, which you haven't done. Um, how do you know that you're on the path to success and how do you communicate that within uh, back to the culture piece? Yeah, I think there's a couple different ways to approach that. I mean, obviously we have the more traditional means. We've got some, some metrics and some KPIs, which we're sort of watching that are more traditional indicators of success. And I'm happy to describe examples of them. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we look at the rate of recovery code download and, um, 
you know, prints, for example. Uh, we also look at the number of account lockouts uh, that are occurring and, and folks attempting recoveries. Um, and then things uh, a little a little less traditional, like one of the things that we did is attempted to sort of move folks gently away from SMS to FA toward more secure options. And we've seen a reduction in those as an example. So those are obviously like the core things that you look at. But I think more importantly, there's some things that are hard to measure. And these are important, I think, for leaders, especially of, of cross-functional efforts like these. You got to look at the health of your team and what they tell you by how they communicate and what re results they produce. Um, I've been tremendously grateful, I think, to or, or fortunate, I think, during this this period to work with a bunch of folks who are deeply dedicated, who believe in the work and have done excellent collaborative work together. And that that environment is palpable. Um, the team is is positive and engaged. And I think those are important things for leaders to pay attention to. Um, you know, if, if they're not seeing that kind of positivity, that kind of engagement, uh, that kind of excitement to do this kind of work, even if it's outside the day to day for some of these folks, it may be a sign that you need to look at how you're setting up your project and what kind of environment you're sort of curating for the team. I love it. Love it. Su super cool. Um, well, per perhaps you'll come back after your presentation and we can have a deeper chat. Until then, uh, I have to, I have to see your talk and, and encourage everybody else to do the same. I think that it's no small feat to to get security baked into uh, business process through development and ops and and customer success and all the other teams you mentioned. And uh, so to hear this story. At Black Hat, I think is is super important, and it's Thursday, August tenth, three twenty in the afternoon. Forty minutes of goodness from uh, John Swanson, all about two uh, FA to what is it, a hundred million developers? It's a hundred million developers on the platform. That's right. Love it. Well, John, thanks for thanks for giving us some insight and uh, sharing a bit about the the culture and the process and. Again, I look forward to to the session and and everybody listening. We'll include a link to that session so you can access that and and John's profile on Twitter and whatnot, so you can connect with him there. And uh, yeah, any other resources you find uh, would be helpful, John. Feel free to share those. And of course, stay tuned, everybody. There's lots coming from uh, Hacker Summer Camp Black Hat USA 2023 as we continue our chats on the road to uh, Las Vegas. Thank yep. you both. Appreciate it. Subscribe. And uh, there's not two factor in playing this episode. So you can share it. That's and right. it's uh, free, it's free play. to play. So. There's no dangers there as far as I know, <laughs> anyway. But thank you very much. <laughs>